for everyone that's with us. Um, this just, meeting is being recorded. Oh, there we go. Thank you so much. Yes, this meeting is being recorded. Um, we had some folks that weren't able to join us, but were um, interested in seeing the conversation. So um, they won't be able to see um, you or your faces, but they will just be able to see the conversation that Von Tree Jones and I are going to have um, for the next 45 minutes to an hour or so. Um, my name is Kristen Glazer. I'm the senior manager of donor relations here at the Greater Cleveland Food Bank. And I have the pleasure of speaking with Von Trees Jones, um, who is the director of agency service, agency and program services here at the Greater Cleveland Food Bank. Um, lovingly go, also goes by the name V, so I will just apologize in advance if I say V instead of Von Trees, um, because that is what she's lovingly known here around the food bank. But um, V has held um, a, a variety of positions here at the food bank and really has grown and um, her latest endeavor has been really having the pleasure of working with our thousand plus program partners that we have out in the community and um, overseeing um, a team over in, um, programs and agency services. And one of the fun things that you folks may have heard about is um, Harvest for Hunger. Um, you may have seen it at your get-go gas station or the little tickets at the end of um, your grocery shopping line um, in a variety of the uh, grocery stores that we have here in Northeast Ohio. But um, whenever you donate to Harvest for Hunger, whether it's at the gas pump, whether it's at um, your grocery store, I know I saw a few folks from Progressive and um, Jones Day on the call as well, whether it's through your personal food drives at your organizations. Um, just wanted to say thank you so much for your support because it goes to helping our program partners um, that V really works with and oversees and it's making an incredible difference in our community. Um, I will pause there. Um, v, is there anything else that you'd like to add just a little bit um, about your background or anything at all? Sure. Um, I would just uh, like to say um, thank you for inviting me to come and talk to uh, supporters of the food bank. I really appreciate it. One of the uh, previous roles that I've held at the food bank uh, was um, senior manager of foundation relations. So I wrote uh, the grant proposals to a lot of our private foundations and uh, corporate as well. And so um, I appreciate the fact that our donors are tuning in to learn more about the food bank. And I hope that um, we have some new and exciting information to share um, and just giving them more insight into uh, what it is that we do to feed the community. Thanks so much, V. Um, well, let's just start um, assuming that no one has any idea what it really looks like to, to be a program agency of the food bank. I know that sometimes, especially when folks come visit for the first time um, at the food bank, um, they sometimes think that we that we ourselves are a partner agency. Um, some folks have told me that they think that we're they expect us to be operating out of the basement of a church or the pantry of a church. And so when they come to the food bank, and I always describe it as like a large Sam's Club or Costco, if you haven't had a chance to visit, um, they are um, a little bit taken aback by just the, the sheer size and breadth and depth of um, our warehouse here um, over on South Waterloo. Um, v, would you mind just giving a quick overview of just how the food bank really works with our partner agencies out in the community and really what that reach looks like? Sure. So we currently have over 1,100 programmatic partners. And so those partners consist of um, emergency feeding programs like your pantry, your hot meal, shelter programs partner with us as well. We have a number of children's programs, the uh, Backpack for Kids program, which provides shelf stable items for kids over the weekend uh, when they don't have access to um, school lunch. We have a Kids Cafe, which is an after school feeding program, um, summer feeding, um, doing meals during the summer months, of course, and then school markets, um, a smaller scale of what would be considered a mobile pantry. Um, many of you have probably seen the Muni lot distribution in action, um, but it's geared towards um, school, uh, school students and families. We also have senior programs. So we have um, a senior box program. So that's shelf stable um, items for a senior um, county specific. We have a caseload of um, a little over 2,800 that we manage um, every year from the state. Um, we also do meals from our kitchen, our senior meals. We hold uh, a contract with Western Reserve 
And so uh, we serve seniors in Cuyahoga and Lake County, as well as senior markets um, and uh, mobile pantries. So though, through those uh, programs, oh, and I'm sorry, we have um, food as medicine programming as well. So partnerships with um, healthcare facilities, federally qualified health centers, et cetera, in terms of making sure that um, clients that are going for visits um, and they um, screen in, uh, for food insecurity that they have access to food as well. So uh, many of you on the call already know that the mission of the Greater Cleveland Food Bank is to ensure that everyone in our communities has the nutritious food they need every day. And so through those programs that I named, that is the um, those are the means that we distribute food. And so it looks different at each um, partner agency. Um, and it's similar to the saying that if you've been to one food bank, you've been to one food bank. Um, I would say, if you've been to one pantry, you've been to one pantry because all of the operations are totally different in terms of the, their day-to-day -day operations. But ultimately, um, clients can um, go to those different locations and receive at least a minimum of three to five days worth of food for each member of their household. And so through those programs, that's how we're able to um, have our reach in a six county service area. And can you talk a little bit about um, how does it work? So a partner, there's a, a program in the community and they want to partner with the food bank. Um, what does that process look like from them applying to them ultimately receiving food on a weekly or monthly basis from us? Sure. So um, we have an application process, which is online. And so if um, an agency um, has 501c3 status or nonprofit status, um, they will go onto our website, complete the application. Um, and once it's submitted, um, myself and others on my team, um, we go out and do a pre-site visit and we just kind of go through their programming, what that looks like. And we also do a deep dive in terms of their location. We know that there are certain um, areas or neighborhoods where there's access, there's um, a, a gap in access to services. And so we really try to make sure that we're looking at the data and those um, specific communities in terms of there's not enough programming in that particular area. And so we um, keep an eye for that to make sure that we're not duplicating services and that they're not sites on top of one another. And so we will also make recommendations in terms of um, hours of operation or days um, that they're open because we want to make sure that a variety of people that are in need of services can attend. And so if we have an application and let's say they typically were open, let's say a Wednesday afternoon from 12 to 2, um, we would make a recommendation, let's say, if they were able to be open in the evening or on a weekend, um, just so that you give working families the opportunity to be able to receive food as well. And so um, just making sure that there's coverage in a number of um, areas. But after the application is submitted, we go out and conduct a pre-site visit. We invite our partners to an orientation. And so that orientation shows them how to order product from our shopping menu. So the same way as if you or I would go to a grocer and log on to their website, there's a shopping menu. And so they would put items in their cart and there's a variety of things from um, produce because of course over 70% of the food we distribute is uh, produce or perishable product. So they would have the option to choose, let's say diapers for um, children or adults, um, things of that nature. And so then they would check out and they can have the option to either pick up from the food bank or they can um, have a delivery. So we coordinate with our fleet to make deliveries as well. And so um, that specifically um, in terms of like our emergency feeding programs, so the pantries, hot meals and shelters, the other programs work a little bit differently in terms of um, mobile pantries or backpacks for kids. And I believe, I think Diana um, had a, a conversation with um, some donors as well. So I won't dive too deeply into that. But in terms of our emergency feeding programs, that's typically the process. Um, they have to make sure. Um, and so we check from a compliance standpoint to make sure that um, clients are served with respect and dignity, that um, the uh, conditions of the pantry or distribution site 
um, are safe, um, there's no food on the floor, that sort of thing. And then they also um, just submit stats every month in terms of like the number of people that they've seen. And so we're truly a partnership and that um, we're working together and just trying to make sure that we support them as best we, we can. Thank you so much. Um, yeah, the tip, way I typically describe it is the food bank is really like the central distribution hub. So we get all of the food donations in. Um, we also purchase a significant amount of food. And then through the work that your team does with those 1,100 plus program partners, um, that's how we then get the food out into their community. Um, so so your churches, your hot meal sites, your homeless shelters, um, truly is a partnership between us being the largest distribution hub and then being the trusted resources in their community to serve their community. Um, I also really appreciate the point that you brought up about evaluating and looking at the area around that partner program or potential partner program to see what other pantries or churches already have operation pantries and operating hours um, and really just trying to make sure that we're planning accordingly um, to best serve our families, um, both in terms of location as well, geography, as well as times. Um, I'm gonna, this is a quiz. Nobody expected to be um, receive a quiz today, but um, our research team that we have here at the food bank, we do have a research team that looks into all of those things as it relates to food security, geography, um, programs that are available and access. Um, and a few years ago, they looked at Cuyahoga County and so the quiz question is, um, in Cuyahoga County, who do you think is the most underserved? What cities in Cuyahoga County do you think are the most underserved? And when I say underserved, I mean um, our neighbors that are in need versus the amount of programs that are available. Um, programs like the church pantries and shelters that B had mentioned earlier. What two cities do you think are the most underserved? And if folks want to put their answers in the chat, um, I'll give about 10 seconds to put those answers in the chat. Also, if you haven't already, um, if you have any questions, by all means, please do put those in the chat and we'll be sure to either address them throughout or, or towards the end. Um, the two most underserved areas in Cuyahoga County when we had done this, oh, good answer, Parma and Euclid, John and Janet, you stole my thunder. Yes, you got it. Parma and Euclid are the two okay. most, John and Janet Mitchell, shocker. <laughs> oh, I should have known they were gonna get it. Okay, I owe you guys lunch. Um, Parma and Euclid are the two most underserved areas in Cuyahoga County and um, we know that through our research team and there was also some efforts that were done um, for the greater Cleveland Food Bank where we actually just opened up another pantry in Euclid. Um, and Tiff will be talking about that shortly, but um, V, you had mentioned the um, research that was done. So I just wanted to take some time just to really show and share how elaborate the greater Cleveland Food Bank truly is with working with the other part partners in the agency in the area um, and really just looking at those things. So I appreciate you highlighting that. Um, Cause I think it's something that a lot of folks may not necessarily realize. Mm -hmm. um, one other thing that I, I, I would love to chat a little bit more about is um, Harvest for Hunger. So a lot of folks have probably heard about Harvest for Hunger and probably maybe have even donated as well. Um, how do those Harvest for Hunger dollars end up supporting our community? Mm -hmm, sure. Um, that's such an important campaign that um, I hope um, those on the call know that we don't take for granted in terms of like the generosity and the community. We really heavily rely on those dollars to be able to, to provide agency support grants to our partners. So um, what we do is twice a year, uh, we make grants to our partner agencies and those grants cover food, non-food items and delivery fees. And so um, based on the number of partners that we have, um, we try to make sure that we use a formula to be uh, fair or equitable across the board. And so we look at the number of people that they've served, the number of um, pounds or meals that they've distributed and their capacity. And so those grants are made twice a year. 
October 1st, and then we have another one coming um, April 1st in just another day or so. And so those grants are put on their food bank accounts for them to draw down or spend um, when they order items from us. And so um, whatever the, so we have been um, fortunate to be able to uh, remove the donated and um, purchase shared maintenance fees um, for our partner agencies because of the generosity of the community. So we've been able to just really just pass on whatever at cost we pay for product, that cost is the same for our partner agencies. And so every um, month or however frequently they like to order, um, they place their order um, online as I shared before. And so it just draws down. Um, and again, it covers delivery fees, but if they pick up, then that those funds are still able to be used for shopping. And so through those Harvest for Hunger dollars, we've been able to really make sure that our partner agencies have what they need to be able to service the community. So um, just as an FYI, the um, cost structure to our partners is that um, bread, pastries, dairy, and produce, those items are all free on our shopping menu. So um, there's absolutely no cost for those. Um, we then we have like retail product that's six cents per pound. So we have um, a variety of donors like Stouffer's, Nestle, um, any other retailers in the area that um, are gracious enough to donate product to us. Um, it's just six cents per pound. And um, I would say the most expensive item is um, meat or other protein items, and that's 19 cents per pound. But you and I know, um, as well as those listening, um, the cost of, let's say, one pack of chicken wings has, you know, gone up significantly just um, because of everything that's going on. And so, um, you know, we try to make it as easy as possible for our partners to be able to serve the community. Um, most of our savvy shoppers, um, they don't spend a lot at all because they're able to, you know, get the free items. And then for a period of time, we also had a lot of um, trade and bonus product on our shopping menu. Um, I will say that, um, and I had glanced while folks were doing the, um, the quiz in the uh, chat, I glanced at the chat. And so um, the cost of inflation across the board has really hit us as well. And so um, we rely on um, donations even more so um, because let's say for example, a case of green beans um, from last year to this year is increased significantly. And so we have to make sure that um, although we have buying power that we're still able to keep up with the cost um, in terms of increase. And so um, for example, it's crazy to say, but like, this month, we've been looking at ordering turkeys for the Thanksgiving holiday season. And yes, already, because we have to source the birds now so that we'll have enough um, for November. But I remember we ordered about six truckloads um, last fiscal year to make sure that, you know, we had enough to distribute to every household. And so this year, in comparison, um, it's a few extra I want to say $100,000 for that same amount for us to distribute. And so we said, well, we really can't have less than what we distributed last year because we know that, um, you know, during the holiday season, um, clients really um, enjoy that opportunity to be able to still have um, what would be considered a regular or normal um, holiday. And so um, the cost has significantly increased. And so we've had to pay that as well for food, for fuel, um, you know, things of that nature. So that's really how the Harvest for Hunger dollars are used to, to support our partner agencies. Yeah, I didn't, um, I heard the green beans stat. I think it was a case of green beans used to cost $6 a case and is now costing us $19 a case as one of the more extreme um, in inflations that we've seen. Um, I did not hear that it's going to be an extra $100,000 to order the exact same order that we placed last year for six truckloads of turkey, turkeys. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. So just like everyone is feeling it in their own grocery budgets when they go shopping, um, the food bank is feeling it and even more so 
those that we're serving, our neighbors are also feeling it. Um, and when you have X amount of dollars, I think sometimes I know we take for granted, um, you know, going to the grocery store and um, things went up a little bit. And so you, you feel a pinch. Um, but, but for those that we serve, that pinch can really mean some tough choices that they have to make mm -hmm. um, between either cutting out a special treat, um, maybe a, a birthday cake that they were thinking of buying, or um, even some tougher choices. Um, so many of those that we serve have to choose between food and medicine um, or, you know, food and, you know, having their car repaired. Um, V and I are both moms. If you didn't hear us chatting earlier um, in the pre-show, I guess, if you will, of this conversation. And um, a lot of parents and grandparents we know are, are making the choice between them eating themselves and um, their children and their grandchildren eating. And those are choices that nobody should have to make. Um, a few years ago, it was February of 2020. So right before many folks were talking about COVID or even knew what COVID was and, and the world was still relatively normal, um, we ended up having a kid's taste test here at the food bank. And um, a few of our different children's programs that we serve, um, Boys and Girls Clubs, Open Doors Academy, um, some schools that we served, they had brought their kids here for um, to try out some new items that our kitchen was considering putting on the menu. And so um, they had um, different tables lined up and the kids kind of went from table to table to table to try um, each of the different items and to give their feedback. And um, if you have kids, they're honest. <laughs> they are brutally honest um, of what they like and what they don't like. And they'll tell you. So it, it's great because that's what we wanted. Um, but there was one little girl. Um, she was probably in middle school. And she had, um, whenever she was given her plate of food to try, she would pass it on to the next one, pass it on to the next one. And she kept on passing on her plate to the, the, littler, the littler kids. Um, she was with a, a group of elementary kids. And um, when we asked if she wasn't hungry or why she wasn't eating, she had said that it was because she wanted to make sure that they all ate first. And it just tells you that she's making those same, having those same thoughts at, at home. Um, and so it is just, you know, not just parents and grandparents, but also some of the older siblings that are also sometimes making some really hard choices as well. Um, so of course we showed her the plethora of food that we had behind us and that she was not going to run out. And once she kind of realized that um, she, she, she dug in, but um, just to show, you know, we talk so many numbers a lot of times of 1100 program partners is sometimes really hard to understand or serving you know 400,000 people in our community but that's exactly what they are is they're people and there's a child there's a senior citizen there's a mom and dad there's someone that just hit a hard time that um they're the ones that you're, you're really making a difference for so um sorry to go off on a little bit of a tangent but the just something you had said made me, me think about it um but it's just especially thoughtful too just when thinking of harvest for hunger and what those agency dollars those grant dollars really mean for our agencies to be able to, to stretch their budgets and to be those savvy shoppers if you will because you know that they are very savvy shoppers when they're looking at our shopping list mm -hmm. um, <laughs> um, going on a little bit more so, um, in talking about our agencies, um, I know that's something new that we had um, done with the um, generosity of the community through the pandemic is we also looked at um, some agency capacity grants that we gave as well. So not necessarily for food, but to really help empower them to do more at their own sites. Could you talk a little bit more about that process and what that really looks like? Sure, that's probably one of the more exciting parts um, that um, I enjoy at this particular time because I went from writing and asking for dollars to support our operations to then being on this side of being able to distribute those dollars um, into the community. And so um, again, because of the generosity of the community, um, we had earmarked um, two years of being able to um, provide capacity grants. So last fiscal year, we did equipment grants um, only. And so um, we awarded, I wanna say approximately 200 sites. And so we opened up the grant opportunity to our network and said, hey, if you're able to distribute more food, what would you need? Please tell us whether it's a pallet jack, 
um, tents and tables for outdoor distributions because COVID, of course, was at its height. And so we wanted to distribute food safely. Um, a lot of our partners ask for shelving, um, freezers, refrigerators, different types of equipment. Some of our hot meal sites were in desperate need of a new stove. Um, and so we opened it up to the network and we said, what do you need? They sent in the application and um, we reviewed them internally. And so we tried to make awards, um, you know, based on true need within the pot that we, that we had. And so I think that process went really, really well. We've gotten some great feedback in terms of thank you so much. You know, we're able to um, accept more donations now because we have um, adequate refrigeration and freezer and that sort of thing. So we know that that made an impact because it does us no good to have uh, food available if we can't get it out to our network. Um, as you all know, um, the direct distributions that we do pretty much at the Muni lot. Um, and then we have a couple of on-site distributions for our senior box program. But other than that, we really rely on the community to be able to distribute um, much needed food. And so this fiscal year at Monday, as a matter of fact, we were so excited to finally be able to release the second phase of these um, capacity grants. And so this time around, um, we didn't limit it to just equipment. We said, hey, tell us what you need to be able to serve more people um, or families to be able to uh, provide a greater amount of food to partners. So let's say moving from three to five days supply for each member, what about um, the ability for like seven to 10 days worth of food? Um, what, what do you need? Is it transportation barriers? Is it um, items that would help you to serve a specific population in terms of having culturally specific items? And so we just released it on Monday. We didn't put a cap in terms of dollar amount because we really wanna see what do folks need? Sometimes it's a matter of they can increase their capacity to be open um, a couple times through the week or more times in the month if the volunteer that's there or there's a staff person that's able to be there to open the pantry and order and you know serve clients and that sort of thing. So we're looking, I'm sure some sites may apply for like a small stipend for some folks to just actually run the pantry. A lot of our emergency feeding sites are run by um, some of our retired um, folks in the community. And so it really is at times a labor of love in terms of the amount of time and effort it puts, uh, you have to put in to serve. And so we're, we're really excited about just seeing what folks are in need of and being able to award those grant dollars to be able to support increasing capacity because we know that um, COVID, um, it revealed a lot for, um, you know, not just our nation, but worldwide in terms of folks finding themselves in our lines or knocking on our doors for support um, and never probably thought in a million years that they would need the assistance of a food bank or food pantry just to be able to get by. And so I think it's been a very big eye opener for a lot of folks to say, you know, at some point, you know, but for God's grace, there go I. And so seeing it day in and day out with the need, um, we just wanna make sure that we really support our partners and make sure that they have everything that they need to be able to serve the community um, more efficiently. Yeah, you are absolutely right. This was just so eye-opening um, for so many ways and some, some silver linings, but also some just really unfortunate realizations that were made um, throughout COVID and the pandemic. And when you talk about the power of, of our network of the 1100 program partners that we have in the six counties that we serve, so up to the Pennsylvania border and down to the Mansfield area, um, it also makes me think of the larger network that we have as well, which is Feeding America. Um, and if anyone um, has not heard of Feeding America, they are a national organization that every single county in the United States um, is covered by a Feeding America food bank. So we are a member food bank of Feeding America, um, as well as about 200 other food banks like the Greater Cleveland Food Bank. And through all of us, um, we all cover and serve every single county in the United States. 
we don't overlap, we don't compete. Um, I always kind of compare it to maybe like the hospital systems where they're in the same area, they're competing. That's not how food banking is. Um, and, and the real beauty of that is the Greater Cleveland Food Bank can talk to other food banks like us and really learn from them of what are your best practices. Um, you piloted this new program, what went well, what were the challenges that you had, what should we consider or be aware of? Um, and it really just allows us to share collective brain power um, and really just kind of expedite some of the learning processes and learning curves um, and really just talk to other folks that are going through exactly the same thing that we are just in different territories. Mm -hmm. um, and then we think of our network that we have through here at the Food Bank, which is our 1100 program partners that V had mentioned. And it's really about us, larger food banks, being able to empower them because they are the ones that are in their community. They are the trusted resource, the trusted pillar in their community also transportation. It's a lot easier for someone to go to a, a pantry or an organization that's in their own backyard than, you know, driving across town or across a couple of towns to get to the food, to the Greater Cleveland Food Bank. Um, so to hear about these agency capacity building grants is just something that is so exciting, so empowering. Um, and it, it really a big thank you to, to our supporters for making that possible. Um, that truly is donor dollars hard at work, um, kind of being funneled through the food bank and then put out directly back into the community. Um, I know V, you had mentioned, um, or you had shared a quote about a um, shelter that's in Richland County, I believe, that they had re uh, received a new um, refrigeration system and they were just beside themselves for the capacity that that has built for them to be able to do so much more. Um, they're able to now store more healthy food. Um, they're also able to now partner and do food rescue with um, mm -hmm. both Starbucks and Olive Gardens in their area because they now have the storage space to be able to do so. So by just providing that refrigeration truly is changing um, that particular agency's um, livelihood as well as just the resources that are then available for the community. So. Um, Thank you for all, because I, I know that's a big effort, <laughs> and and thank you so much for for doing that and just making it so easy for our organizations as well. Yeah, so through our uh, retail donation program, um, we have a couple of managers that um, you know really work closely with a lot of our, um, I guess, vendors or retailers that may have excess product or that um, they would like to donate to the food bank. And so through that program, it makes it a lot easier for the particular partner site that's in closer proximity to just either um, go directly there and have like pickups or drop offs directly at their site opposed to um, the vendor bringing it to the food bank. And then now we have to um, get it to the partner agency. So it just kind of cuts us out um, and it, it makes it a whole lot easier for some of those partner sites that participate in that program to just be able to do more and have um, you know an additional set of items to be able to distribute or, or provide to the community. So we appreciate um, donors in that sense as well in terms of um, donating product to us that we can then make available to our network. Yeah, and, and speaking of just the transportation, um, made me think of our um, new partnership with DoorDash. Would you mind sharing a little bit about that? Sure. So, um, we're working on a uh, currently working on a pilot with them. Um, if I just back up a little bit, at the height of um, COVID, of course, our senior population was most vulnerable. Um, and so when we had the benefit of the National Guard being at the food bank, they were able to make those home deliveries. So a lot of clients would call our help center and say, you know, hey, um, you know, I can't really get out, but I am in need of food or I have um, a transportation barrier. And so they were gracious enough to make those home deliveries. And so um, we you know, appreciated that. But then when their um, time was up with us, we were still left without the capacity to continue distributing food to, um, to homebound clients or those with um, compromised immune systems. And so recently uh, we've partnered with DoorDash. And so they um, offer this in-kind service free of charge. And so we did the pilot with our senior box program. And so there were a lot of seniors that 
um, they couldn't get to, you know, whatever the nearest site was that participated. And so DoorDashers comes to the food bank and then they deliver within, I believe, a 10 mile radius to, um, to clients in the area. And so thus far it's been going really, really well. And so um, when you talk about um, information sharing within the network, I recently learned that um, our peers at uh, Akron Canton Regional Food Bank, um, they're partnering with DoorDash as well, but they've taken it a step further in that DoorDash is going directly to the partner agencies and then delivering food to those clients. So I have um, an email out to connect and figure out, okay, what are the logistics? How does that work? Um, because we'd love to be able to extend that opportunity to our network as well. There are a number of folks that are already doing home deliveries. And so, um, you know, it's coming out of their own budget or, um, you know, they're having to spend their own funds and resources. And so, as we know, the prices of um, gas have gone up drastically. And so we want to be able to op offer that opportunity as well to our partner network. And so um, it's really exciting because a lot of times um, for some, that delivery may be the only time that they connect with someone else, you know, for the day or just being able to receive food that, um, they otherwise couldn't get out to receive. And so we're, we're really grateful for that addition. And so we hope that the pilot continues to go well and to be able to expand it. That's amazing. And, and that was also something that came out. Um, those home delivered meals were really critical during the pandemic. Mm -hmm. And so, um, and the National Guard played an incredible role in making that possible. Um, and of course the, the National Guard hasn't been with us um, since July. But um, being able to just continue moving that work forward in this way is um, just been really, really critical. And it's I'm just so glad to hear about DoorDash and and then making that possible for us. That's just really special, really, really special. I agree. Um, thinking a little bit more about, you know, on the topic of just sharing best practices um, and really empowering the network, whether it's through Feeding America or with our own local network of partner agencies, um, would you mind talking a little bit about the agency conference that we have every year? Sure. So um, last fiscal year, we had a virtual conference um, because, of course, 2020, we were unable to. But um, it really is an opportunity to just kind of have a meeting of the minds and, and share with the entire network what's working, what's not working, well, how do you operate, um, what have you been able to do to pivot during the pandemic. And so um, at first we were like, oh, well, you know, it's always better in person, but it worked out really well um, having the virtual conference because folks were able to still ask questions and connect with one another. Um, throughout that week. Um, and so we like to share best practices in terms of food distribution efforts and any ways that you can kind of improve or make it better, uh, more efficient, and sometimes easier for clients to access food. So aside from the agency conference that we try to have every year, we also have a number of other um, learning opportunities. And so many of you may be familiar with uh, Kimmy Lovano, our Director of Advocacy, or Noel Rivera, um, who's also um, on her team as well. We make um, those types of um, lunch and learns available to our network as well. And we have a portal with all types of uh, nutrition education information. Um, we have nutrition educators that um, contract with us that go out into the community and they do um, food demos or um, there's an abundance of recipe cards for our partner agencies to utilize and just making sure that if there's an item that's typically um, not at uh, folks aren't as familiar with that's being distributed there's a recipe card to go along with it and if our partners want um, one of the nutrition educators to come free of charge they will come to the site and kind of do a sampling right on the spot and we find that it increases um, that product being taken um, and so there's always opportunity for learning we have um, feeding america conferences this um I want to say maybe a week or two ago, there was a virtual one for food bank staffers, but we had hoped that if it was in person, we had put in the budget to allow um, two partner agencies to go to just have some learning opportunity there. So whatever we can do in terms of making sure that 
we're doing all we can to serve those who need us most. Um, we're always all about it and um, eager to do more. That's great. Thank you so much. Um, how would you say, what do you anticipate the next, you know, three, six, nine, 12 months to look like now that we're hopefully coming out of this pandemic? Any, any particular challenges that you see or um, opportunities um, as it relates to our partner agencies or, or just the food bank in general? I would say probably more of an opportunity is that um, a lot of our partner agencies, like the clients or neighbors um, that they serve, they sometimes become an extension of your family. And so it's similar in that a lot of us, um, we've worked remotely um, for the past couple of years. And so it's funny how when we see one another, it's like, hi, I haven't seen you in a while. Sometimes you just don't know how much you've missed someone until you actually see them in person. Um, and so I think opportunities, um, the big ones, for our partner agencies are to go back to choice distributions. Um, we really had to revert back to the traditional way in terms of, um, you know, distributing food, which really wasn't, it's never the best option. I mean, I know that the end result is that um, families get the food that they need. However, um, when you say choice, Oops, sorry to interrupt. When you say choice versus traditional, do you just mind kind of clarifying really quickly like what that really means? Sure. So um, a best practice with um, a choice model distribution is that a, a neighbor can come in and choose what items that they want or need for their particular household. Um, and so it increases the likelihood of them actually consuming the items and really giving a sense of dignity um, to them to be able to choose what it is that they um, feed their families. Traditional is more so like a pre-packed bag or box of items and pretty much everybody kind of gets the same thing. And so um, depending on, you know, if there's dietary restrictions or cultural foods that just aren't um, eaten, it just is kind of like a one size fits all. And we know that one size doesn't fit all. So I would say the opportunity would be um, as people are more comfortable in getting um, back into the swing of things or whatever normal was prior to COVID, being able to allow um, neighbors to choose their own products. I would say um, being able to collaborate more, um, a lot of um, partners, you know, some of them, at the height of the pandemic closed and the vast majority have reopened, but um, they've had to amend the way that they reopened. So there were some positive things that came out of it in terms of still doing like a drive-through distribution and that sort of thing. Um, but there's a lot of opportunity for more collaboration, for more learning opportunities, for even us to get out into the community more. Like when we do our site visits, we've had to do them virtually. And so sometimes it's good to just be in the community. So I would encourage um, anyone who hasn't um, volunteered at the food bank, um, of course, please do so. Um, there's a number of different projects from, you know, being in our kitchen, our repack area, or being a skill-based volunteer. Like if you have a skill um, that you, you know, or you're retired and you were in a certain field and would like to come and um, volunteer with us, we'd love to have you. But other alternatives are some of our partner agencies are in need of volunteers right there in their community. And so through our volunteer experience department, um, some of our partners have, we have opportunities on our portal to be able to offer that as an additional layer of support. So like if you see a pantry or hot meal program in your neighborhood and it's easier for you to just go a mile away to volunteer and give back, and that makes sense for you, then please do that. Um, but really just getting back into the swing of things with um, being able to have an even bigger impact. And I know that we do a lot here at the food bank and we move really, really quickly um, and always have to be able to transition as you know, um, dealing with whatever's going on for the time being. But I think we would do a really good job, but that's because we have a good support system in terms of um, donors, volunteers, partner agencies, and that sort of thing. So, so those are some opportunities that I think um, will present themselves again. 
and, and that choice and the dignity that comes with that choice, Von Trees, is something that's so important. And I think sometimes you lose sight of it because, I mean, especially with the pandemic, I mean, it was just a machine. I mean, overnight, needs skyrocketed, food went down very quickly, and you're just like, okay, how do I get as much food out to the people that need it as quickly as po as quickly and as safely as possible, um, which was the, the the main goal. Um, but hopefully, as we're we're heading into an opportunity, an area where we can do things and offer choice again, um, it really is important to try to get back to that place. Um, I don't know if I've shared this with you or not, but um, within the past year or so, uh, we ended up receiving a letter from a donor of ours. Um, he had um, when he when he was he reflected on the fact that when he was a, a young child his family went to the, their church food pantry and he would go with his mom. And every time he went, it was the same volunteer that was always there. Every time he went, um, she let him pick out the cereal that he wanted. And it was something that he remembers as a grown adult of just being able to have that choice and that excitement. And, and like you said, just that dignity and pride of, I really want, you know, Cocoa Puffs today or Cheerios or whatever the case may be. I mean, that was an ingrained lifelong memory for that little boy who is is, is now a donor. Um, and he remembers that specific time and that very special volunteer in that pantry. And so um, it really, it's just a good reminder of just the human element of what we're doing and, and how important that is um, through the food bank and through our partner agencies. Um, so I agree with you. There, there's a lot of opportunity there. And it sounds like folks are, are excited to kind of head back towards that area as well. Mm -hmm. I, agree. I agree. Um, thinking a little bit more, um, I know I, I've thought I've shared a few stories, but are there any particular stories, um, that just kind of recall in your memory of just being, you know, particularly impactful or just important or just anything at all as it relates to our partner agencies, um, and, or, um, those that we serve? I would say... One that comes to mind um, is that um, is Garden Valley uh, Neighborhood House. They've gone through a few um, different transitions over the past few years in terms of like um, their name um, and transition of leadership. But I would um, call out specifically um, the late Quentin Durham, who um, was really such an angel and such a gentle um, soul. He operated that pantry. And of course, that's a community center um, in the Kinsman area. And so they do more than um, where they have other programs outside of like their food pantry and mobile pantry distribution. But I would say he operated that pantry and mobile pantry well into his early 80s. And it wasn't just a labor of love, but he used his resources that we were able to provide for him, but he also gave of his personal, um, from his personal finances to make sure that uh, folks in the community had what they needed. And so um, he would come here um, sometimes after he would have his chemo treatment and he would pick up food and then he would take it back and he would deliver it for the distribution that day. And he would come and shop in the marketplace for like some last minute items to add on for families. And I can remember talking to him on a number of occasions. And um, I would say, Mr. Quentin, you got to take it easy. You know, you, you got to slow it down. And he's like, well, if I don't come, how are people in my community going to eat? And so um, we could never get him to slow down. And until, um, you know, he passed on and transitioned, um, he was still serving at that pantry. Um, and so it was amazing to see at his funeral homegoing service, the amount of clients in that neighborhood that attended his service and just spoke to how generous and compassionate he was to them. Um, and so I would say that particular agency, um, that's probably one that will always um, be with me, um, aside from the fact that I could remember as a little girl during the summer months when we had like a summer school, um, 
my mom would take my sisters and I and we would go there. And so we would spend like most of the day while she was at work and the, they partnered with the food bank. And so I can remember like the, the lunches during the summertime and the other activities that we did. And so um, I know what it's like to rely on services, um, you know, that we distribute like um, after school programs, relying on a meal or summer programming while, you know, folks, other folks may, you know, have a great summer, but it was a great experience for me because it kind of was a full circle moment when I had the opportunity to come to the food bank about eight and a half years ago, just remembering as a kid what it was like to get a meal, um, you know, like breakfast and lunch while I was there for the summer. So, um, so I would say the late Quentin Durham is probably like a standout and will probably always be because until his dying day, he still served. And so I think um, the greatest among us is those who are able to serve and um, support others. And, and food is such a basic need that you don't take it for, like you, you can take it for granted if you're not careful, you know, the ability, as you said before, to be able to go into your own refrigerator or pantry and fix whatever it is you want or put whatever in your shopping basket and, and ultimately have the means to pay for it. So I would say, I would say him, I would say Quentin. Well, you know, he's smiling down with that. Thank you so much for sharing that, V. That was, that, that's really special. And, and I've heard so many of those types of stories from so many of our agencies. I mean, it's just not a job or a volunteer opportunity. I mean, it, opportunity for them. It is their, it is a part of them and in and, and what makes them who they are. Um, and it's just such an honor and privilege to be able to, to work with so many good people like that. Um, so thank you for all that you do, especially in your work and being able to work directly with them on such a regular basis. Um, that story that you had shared actually teed up really nicely for a um, question from the audience from Ray. Um, and this is for you particularly, Von Trees. Um, how did your prior work experience prepare you for the challenges of working with the food bank? Oh, I, and I didn't even see that question. And I'll try to hurry up because I know we're running out of time. Um, thank you for that question. I would say um, early on in my career, um, well, I have um, a master's in community health education. So I always have had a passion to um, to serve and to help in the community. Um, and so early on in my career, a lot of my jobs were grant funded positions, which is ultimately how I ended up learning how to write grants because I needed to keep a job. So um, so I kind of fell down a rabbit hole in terms of fundraising for worthy causes. And, um, you know, I've done so for a number of nonprofits, including um, Akron Children's Hospital prior to the food bank, and then of course coming to the Greater Cleveland Food Bank. Um, and so I think that prior experience helped me to understand what it takes to actually implement a program, to run it day to day, to make sure that you're planning properly um, in terms of um, keeping accurate record of like your budgets and reporting and the number of folks that you've served to be able to make a good case for why those services are needed. Um, and so now being on the flip side, um, going back to direct service, I really, really enjoy it because you, I, maybe it's selfish to say, but like you get to see the fruits of your labor on a regular basis. And so you get to see those thank yous, um, you get those notes, um, those phone calls with, I appreciate all that you guys are doing. And so it's not just a feel good moment, but you know that um, folks really appreciate the fact that you've got someone that has written a check or, you know, went online and, and they're a monthly donor to just be able to look out for the next person or the next neighbor. So I would say um, in a nutshell, those are things that, that help me to um, be able to relate to our partner agencies as well, because I've been on the side um, of receiving benefits and even in undergrad um, needing SNAP just to make sure that like I had groceries, you know. Um, so it's, it's an important, it's, it's not just important work, but I, I would say like for many of us, like it's our life's work um, and fulfilling a purpose. 
Absolutely. Thank you so much. And, and also being mindful of time, we have a few more minutes, so we may have time for um, one or two more questions. Um, so if you have those, please share them. Um, I see a question from Christina, which is an incredibly thoughtful question um, in regards to if she wanted to adjust her monthly donation for inflation, is there a suggested percentage? And Christina, we will reach out to you offline. That is a fantastic question, and I want to make sure that I give you the right answer. But Thank you so much for thinking of that. And I, I promise that we will be in touch soon. And, and also thank you for your monthly support. Um, if anyone else has any questions, um, I would put them in the chat pretty quickly and we will try to get to them. Um, if not, we will definitely follow up with you. But um, V, you brought up one thing um, that is important. We haven't talked about it yet, but um, can you talk about um, some of our partnerships that we have on college campuses? Because um, hunger in on college campuses is something that, um, is there and it's important, but I don't think everyone necessarily realizes it. Yeah, so currently um, we partner with all of the locations um, at Tri-C. Um, they all have pantries um, over the winter break. Um, actually, any break. We've had um, uh, folks from like Baldwin Wallace uh, reach out to us and a few other campuses in terms of um, needing food while there's a vacation, like a winter break, because not everyone's going home or, you know, they may have to stay on campus or they live locally. And so we've partnered in, in that capacity to make sure that those students still have food and food resources while others are away, especially during um, holiday seasons. And so, um, you know, we partner with them in the same way um, that we do with our other agencies in terms of they receive grant, um, grant support, agency capacity, um, dollars, um, you know, any other like educational or learning opportunities as well, um, because we do know that um, College, the, the college population is, is a really food insecure one. And a lot of times folks don't realize it because it's not talked about as often and it's not as glaring um, as like children's, you know, or children or seniors maybe. Thanks so much. Um, thank you for being, I really appreciate that. Um, well, we have about three minutes left and wanna be mindful of everyone's time. Um, I don't see any other questions, um, but V, are there any last words that you, you'd like to leave us with um, today? Sure, I would um, just say thank you again um, to you and your team. I know Kathy, Carrie, Ben, um, Kate, that um, you guys make this opportunity available to donors to kind of give them a greater sense of um, our work and um, how their support impacts the community. So thank you for inviting me to do that. Um, I'd like to thank the folks on the call for taking time out of their day to just chat with us or to just listen in and ask questions about our work. Um, it means a great deal that, um, you know, we know that the work isn't in vain, but we couldn't do with what we do without um, the financial support and even with um, volunteering efforts. And so I would just say, if you guys have any questions um, that you think of later, um, please make sure that you contact Kristen or anyone from her team, we'd be happy to help. And if there are um, partner agencies in your community that you'd like to go and volunteer or just kind of see them in action, we'd love to, um, to take you. And so um, when our new building is open, end of July, beginning of August, after we get settled. We'd love to have you there. I'm sure Kristen will have you guys um, for a tour as well. So we're just looking forward to continuing to grow and to serve more people who need us most. And hopefully at some point, we'll work ourselves out of a job. But until then, um, we'll just keep doing all that we can um, for our neighbors. Thank you so much, V. That was, that was incredibly kind of you. And thank you also for coming um, in to speak with us today while your girls are home on spring break. Um, if yeah. that's not dedication and passion to a job, um, I, I, I don't know what is. So thank you so much for that. And, and um, I echo everything that you said. Thank you so much to everyone that's on the line with us. Um, I know we have some folks that have attended every single one of these um, since they started last year as a way for us to engage with folks um, virtually. Um, and Carrie really led the charge on that. So thank you to Carrie for all of her hard work and really kicking this off. And now Kate, who is um, 
the woman behind the scenes making it all possible and also Kathy and Ben as well on the team. Um, if anyone wants to come for a tour or to learn more about volunteering at the food bank or at one of these partner agencies, um, we have a whole team full of people that would just love to, the opportunity to um, chat with you more. Um, but in the meantime, just a big thank you to everybody. Also, thank you to everybody um, who has um, participated or is considering participating in Harvest for Hunger. Like I said, whether it's at the um, grocery checkout line, attending market at the food bank, which will be back in person um, for the first time in a couple of years, it'll be on um, Sunday, May 1st, or if it's through um, your companies or just coming to volunteer during the season, um, we appreciate it more than, than you could ever imagine. So thank you for everything. And um, hopefully we'll see folks again back at the end of the month. Um, Camille Lovano will be chatting about ad our advocacy work. And so so um, that will definitely be a um, very lively discussion. But um, everyone on the call, including UV, thank you so much for everything that you do. We, we truly, truly do appreciate it. Thank you. You're most welcome. Bye, everybody. Have a wonderful day. Bye, everybody. See ya.